This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Now, tonight for the, the main event, I'm really honored to be able to introduce our distinguished speaker, Angel Martinez, who is chairman and CEO and president of Decker's Brands. Uh, Angel, importantly, is a UC Davis graduate, earning his Bachelor of Arts from the College of Letters and Sciences in 1977. Uh, his career achievements are many and impressive. In 1988, he joined Reebok International as their West Coast sales representative, and he led the team that designed and marketed the legendary freestyle aerobic shoe. Those of us who were young in the 1980s remember that shoe, I'm sure. Uh, Angel also established Reebok's presence in Hollywood, aggressively placing his products in television, music, and film production, and ensuring the brand's uh, long-term visibility. In 1994, Angel was named president and CEO of the Rockport Company, largest subsidiary of Reebok International, where he successfully directed a product and marketing program that focused on younger consumers and achieved significant sales and profit increases. Um, moving to his current uh, affiliation, he joined Decker's Brands in 2005 as CEO and president and was named chairman of the board in 2008. Many of you, I think probably all of you, are likely familiar with Decker's brand's footwear. Decker's often offers seven different brands, UGG Australia, Teva, Sanuk, Subo, Anu, Mozo, and Hoka 1-1. Um, so I wonder how many of you currently own a pair of uh, some of those brands? Show of hands, uh, Ron's got a few. Yes, excellent. Uh, I was saying earlier that uh, I have a 10-year-old daughter who's very fashion forward. She's extremely hard to impress, but I had mentioned where I would be tonight, and so this morning at breakfast, she pulled out a catalog and pointed to the um, Ugg Azalea, which she wanted registered for her um, upcoming holiday list, so that's good. <laughs> All right. Um, so there are obviously many of your customers in our audience tonight. Um, uh, I also want to mention that uh, Decker's record of corporate responsibility practices are equally impressive. They include deep commitments to employees, surrounding communities, and the environment. Um, and as a result of this, Decker's was named by Outside Magazine as one of the best places to work five times over the last six years. Very impressive. So without uh, much further ado, I hope you will join me in welcoming this UC Davis alum who has truly distinguished himself both in business and in corporate citizenship, Angel Martinez. Before Angel comes to speak to us, uh, we're going to show you a short video um, and then he will take the stage. Thank you. Our mission at Deckers is to inspire the unconventional. The idea that in order to break through, in order to stand out, you have to have something that people care about, something people are passionate about, brands that matter, brands that mean something. And that's always set us apart from the rest. It really does go back to the founding of the company by Doug Otto in 1973. Doug was obsessed with surfing, and he decided he was going to make a living from his passion. Doug hit on an idea for a flip-flop. The neoprene deck was multicolored, and the kids started calling the shoes Deckers. And that's how Deckers was born. Our brands represent what people do for passion. We can start with Teva. When Teva hit the market, no one had ever seen anything like it. Now here's a guy, Mark Thatcher, 
who was a passionate river guide. And he wanted to invent a sandal that you could actually do active sports in that would not fall off and that would be incredibly comfortable. Sanuk is a good example of something in our recent portfolio that Jeff Kelly started because Jeff didn't want to fit into the conventional world. He wanted to make a living from his passion. When I first saw Sanuk, I didn't know what it was. I said, is that, what is that? Is that a shoe or is it a flip-flop? Is it a sandal? I mean, what is it? And it didn't matter because when I put it on, I knew exactly what it was. It was the most comfortable thing I'd worn in years and years. Ugg was a product that was developed by surfers in Australia who wanted to keep their feet warm and free of sand and, you know, really create a product that was iconic to the surf industry. No one would have predicted that Ugg would go from a surf brand to a brand that's almost inseparable from the fashion uh, connoissance that you see on Fifth Avenue or any other fashionable domain in the world. Once you have Ugg in your closet, you'll always have Ugg in your closet. And that's how impactful this brand has become. Hoka is a brand that was created for ultra marathon running, for running 100 mile races on trails. And the original prototypes are quite interesting. They look like these uh, giant fat pads that you could strap to your existing shoes. They soon realized that there was an opportunity to create a new idea around footwear. It looked different, it felt different, and it performed differently. Deckers is about the people. And it's the people who create the brands. And it's the brands that create the value for shareholders and investors. In many other public companies, it's the reverse. It's the investors, the brands, and then it's the people. You don't have to look far to see that it's the unconventional and the unique point of view and the unique perspective that in the end creates value. When there's commitment and dedication to a vision to have bold ideas come to life, I think that unconventional approaches to this business, unconventional perspectives on the business, are what give you the spark and give people the insight necessary to compete today. If we were all viewing the world through the same mindset, with a cookie cutter approach, then in fact we'll end up with the same kind of boring, mediocre product that consumers are burdened with today. And we choose not to do that. Our mission at Deckers is to inspire the unconventional, and that's always set us apart from the rest, and it will continue to do so. Now, the caveat is that as long as we do our part to stand out, to be noticed, to solve problems, and search for opportunity in unconventional places, we'll be very successful and we'll meet that mission. I'm Angel Martinez, Chairman, President, and CEO of Deckers Outdoor Corporation. It's great to be back on campus. Uh, Frankie and I both graduated from UCD um, a long time ago. And one of the things that we noticed today when we got off the plane was how damn hot it is here. <laughs> we live in Santa Barbara now, you know, so it's, uh, it's nowhere near what I got used to. I used to run, my favorite time of day to run during cross country season was noon. I loved it, I thought it was fabulous, you know, and now, are you kidding me? <laughs> that would never happen. So I, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the, a couple of folks in the room, but specifically Dean Mangan for uh, enticing me to come and, and speak here tonight. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here, uh, get back to the, this wonderful university. And John Vos, who was uh, one of my professors uh, when I was here back in the day. Uh, I noticed the title of this uh, event is the Dean's Distinguished Speaker Event. 
I'm not that distinguished, okay? John was always the most distinguished looking gentleman I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> this guy looked distinguished 40 years ago with the white, you had white hair 40 years ago. <laughs> it was a little bit more of it. You still have more hair than me, so, but that's distinguished. But I also uh, would like to also acknowledge the, uh, the students that are in the room. Can you all raise your hands, please, the students? Great, important to know. Because it's really to you who I uh, want to make my comments uh, meaningful. I've been at this a long time. Ever since I graduated, I've been selling shoes. Nothing wrong with selling shoes, by the way. It's, as, uh, to paraphrase Juan Marichal, former San Francisco giant great, uh, footwear has been very, very good to me. <laughs> And I, I do want to spend some time really talking and focusing on leadership because a few years ago when I was coaching cross country at my son's high school, I coined this idea, this phrase, this way of thinking that I tried to embed in their heads for a couple of years. And I think it's, it's sad because I still get emails from these kids. And it was that what got you here won't get you there, simply put. What got you here won't get you there. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how many successes you think you've had. I don't care how great everyone thinks you are. It's not going to mean anything if you don't focus on what you need to do to go there. Uh, it is always a challenge in life that we, we are confronted with obstacles. We overcome those obstacles. And then we think that we've arrived because we've overcome. But the fact is, all we've done is set ourselves up to overcome the next obstacle. That's the process that creates success in life, in my mind. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, as is, uh, specific to leadership, is, and I, this is ridiculous, because if you read the, uh, the bio, you know, the thing, I don't know, in the invitation, right, there, there was a quote from me, right? I'm going to quote myself, which is, you don't do that when you're making a presentation. I mean, that's ludicrous. But I am going to quote myself because I want to frame the conversation a little bit as to what it is that I, I believe and what I think is very important. But I said this. <laughs> I actually did, I'm proud of myself for saying this. Every once in a while, I was, you know, I've met over the years some stand-up comics who have jokes that have gone on for 20 years, and they're proud of themselves for thinking of the joke. Well, this is not a joke, but it's kind of the same thing. I said, the most effective leaders lead through a highly developed sense of compassion and empathy. Only when people truly believe that you understand their real needs and are committed to seeing those needs met, can you begin to harness the power of the collective genius that is at the core of every organization's potential? I'd have paid me a few bucks for that. But that came as a result of, uh, well, really almost 40 years of being in the business that I'm in and, and uh, having participated in the growth and success of quite a few companies and a few brands. I was one of the very first, uh, I was the third employee at Reebok. I had been uh, wanting to make a passion from my, uh, a living from my passion, which was running. And uh, as a matter of fact, I thought that this uh, new facility was on our old cross country course, but not, not really Joe, who's lived in Davis the whole time, uh, corrected me. But it f there was nothing but dirt out here. And now you have these spectacular buildings, uh, a true testament to, uh, to this university and what it's capable of doing. But what I wanted to do was really focus in on that, that statement and really begin to dissect it a little bit and to give you an insight as to what I believe makes for truly effective leadership, uh, not just in the business I'm in, but in all of my contacts and conversations over so many years with so many people from so many other businesses and other walks of life at Reebok, we started something called the Reebok Human Rights Award, and I served on the board of that award with Jimmy Carter, and with Desmond Tutu, and with Sting, and with Peter Gabriel, and you know, I'm dropping names here, and I don't do that. 
But I want you to understand that leadership, I've been around leaders and I've been around leadership. And over time you start to sort of extract from those conversations. So let's talk about a couple things specific to leadership and maybe coming from this quote that I just gave you. Most effective leaders through a highly developed sense of compassion and empathy. Empathy. How do we learn empathy? What is empathy all about? Does anyone deny that you can't lead without a sense of empathy for the people you're leading? I think I referenced the first chapter in a book, Leaders Eat Last. I don't know how many of you read that little first introduction, actually. Simon Sinek, are you familiar with Simon Sinek? If you're not, you should read. If you're interested in leadership in any way, shape, or form, read the book, Leaders Eat Last. I highly recommend it. As a matter of fact, I'm, he's coming back to Decker's next week, and we're going to spend some time together, dropping names once again. Empathy is one of those things that is, is you can't fake empathy. It's hard earned. My empathy came not from any formal training in empathy. I never went to the seminary. I was not a, uh, uh, a volunteer at my church uh, during the holidays. I didn't do any of that stuff. I grew up in the South Bronx, very tough environment. I saw very bad things happen to people who didn't deserve to have it happen to when I was a kid. I don't know how many of you ever remember seeing the movie Fort Apache, the Bronx with Paul Newman. Well, that movie came out, it was a big you know, shock that that there was a neighborhood like that in America. And when I saw the movie, I realized that was my neighborhood. I didn't know that I lived in that neighborhood. I had moved since to California, which saved my ass. <laughs> but empathy came from observation. Empathy came from having a sense that other people didn't have it quite as good as you did, even though you thought you didn't have it that good yourself. Empathy is one of those things that only is learned from being absorbed in the environment, being a participant in what is going on around you, feeling, seeing, knowing, having a sense that, wow, that could be me. And if it were me, what would I do? And from that component, that empathy, that idea that I need to be ingrained in what's really happening, you develop a sense of compassion. You say, if that's happening to them and it could happen to me, then how, in fact, can I avert their pain? Because I don't want to share that pain someday. How can I create a vehicle in some way so that I don't have to participate in that suffering, whatever that suffering may be? It could be economic suffering. It could be... Uh, psychological suffering. It could be the suffering that comes from addiction of various kinds. It could be the suffering that comes from abuse. Compassion. I think those are things that I learned in an environment, in a, in a tough neighborhood in a city like New York, uh, which I benefited from tremendously. And that I think I, I, I would ask you to ask yourselves, have you been exposed to the things in your lives as students, I'm talking to the students, that give you a highly evolved sense of, of compassion and empathy. Because I don't believe, I think that at the core of effective leadership is this seed, this central seed, this thing that you've got to have. I've never seen any leader or anyone be acknowledged as a leader the true kind of leaders who didn't have this. And it's essentially, uh, it's required. The other thing that I, I found over the years is that people have to actually believe what you're talking about. They have to believe what you're saying. You have to have, because of your highly evolved sense of compassion and empathy, they have to have a real belief that you understand their real needs. A belief. Now, belief is something that, you know, a lot of folks, we treat that so lightly today. You know, belief is one of those things, can you buy belief? If I have an ad campaign that's really good, can I get you to believe just about anything? 
Seems that way, actually. Uh, I could actually do a lot of things rhetorically, because that was, that was my, my background here at UC Davis, that you later find are being, those are manipulative tools that you can get people to think and, and do lots of different things. And that's been true for thousands of years and it will always be true. But real belief, belief grounded in that compassion and empathy that I'm talking about, uh, actually creates a bond between yourself and the people that, that are looking to you for advice or looking to you for leadership in that early stage of leadership. By the way, if you're not a leader yet, you've got some compassion, you've got some empathy, you may not have achieved any belief yet. You might be full of And there's a lot of leaders out there who are, pardon my French, full of They've got faux compassion, They've got faux empathy, and they've got buku full of shit. <laughs> True belief really is grounded in the idea that the person truly understands that you are committed to their real needs, that you understand their real needs, that you are there to create for them an alternate future in the case of someone running a business, an alternate future in the case of someone uh, who may be a professor, an alternate future in the case of someone among you who might be an entrepreneur, who may want to say, I can create an opportunity for a bunch of us, and we can really make this happen. Just think, if this were to happen, and here's why I think that, and, and not do it in any at Decker's, I refer to all of this as the bullshit-free zone. We have a bullshit-free zone in my company. I don't tolerate it. So when I say something, it has to live yeah, within that bullshit-free zone. So that people truly believe that I, that I, as the leader, I've been appointed, if you will, as the leader, that I understand, and that they, are, they will have their lives enhanced by whatever it is that we are driving toward together. If you can't get to that place, I don't care how much leadership theory you study. I don't care how many articles you read. I'm boiling it down to you, to the essence of 40 years of doing this kind of stuff. You know, back, let me pick a couple of pages from the Reebok past. When I started at Reebok, it was simply a running shoe company. It had, it's the oldest athletic shoe company in the world, by the way. It started in 1895. The guy who started Reebok was a teenage 800-meter runner in England. You know, did you see the movie Chariots of Fire, any of you in the room? Old movie about the 1924 uh, Olympics in, in, uh, in Australia, or no, what year was it? 28 Olympics, I think. Anyway, these guys in the long white shorts and white t-shirts with the Union Jack, all of those guys were wearing Reebok shoes way back when. That's how long ago this company has been around. And, and it was a very successful company for many years. It was called the Foster Deluxe Running Pump Company because they invented the track spike. This guy, Joe Foster, invented the track spike. A kid went into a barn, put nails in the bottom of some pumps, as they were called, and came out and ran on the track and got an advantage and won some races. Started a company. That company, uh, when I started, was trying to start selling product in the United States, and there were three of us. I had just recently graduated, a couple of years earlier, from UC Davis. I had opened my own running shoe store, and I thought, I want to get in on the other side of the fence. I'm tired of being, I mean, I was working too much, you know. Uh, two running stores I had, I was open seven days a week. We had a running club with 300 members. I was putting on a road race. I was killing myself, and all the reps that came in to call on me were driving BMWs and didn't seem to do any work. All they did was take me to lunch, and people liked me to lunch. So I wanted to get on the go-to-lunch side, take, you know, take people to lunch side of the fence. I didn't, realize, I didn't think I needed to work quite as hard as I was working. So really, we began this idea of Reebok, try to bring this high-level brand in those days, the highest priced product in the running industry was $49.95 for the Nike Tailwind, which was the first air shoe. We came out with our shoe at $59.95 just because. 
because it was made in England. Actually, it was made in England, and it was the oldest athletic shoe company in the world, and we thought that right there is why it should be $59.95. And so we did that. We, we launched, and we got to $13 million in the second year. And uh, at that point, the running boom had started to level. We were slowing down, and retailers didn't have much reason to bring in Reebok. So I remember taking a trip through my territory, which was Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, and my in Frankie's little Datsun, that was Nissan back in the day before. Now. <laughs> and anyway, uh, realizing as I was finishing my three-week tour that I had lost $130. And I had been eating McDonald's and staying in Motel 6 the whole time, so this is not the lap of luxury. I wasn't taking anybody to lunch, and no, I did not have a BMW. And so I remember calling the CEO, who was the CEO of a company of now about eight people, from Redding, California, on I-5, on a payphone, because I wasn't driving, and you know, there was none of that. And I said to the guy, you know, I just swung through my territory, I've lost $130. I, I can't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. I think we should make aerobic shoes. And his response was, what's aerobics? Because it hadn't hit New England yet, and Frankie was doing aerobics. And I said, well, I know exactly, what, here's what it is. I've been, Frankie's been doing it, I've been doing it, and we need shoes because they're all barefoot on carpeted floors, getting blisters and burns and on and on. And, and by the way, if they wear any shoes at all, they're wearing ugly, bulky running shoes, and they don't look cute. Because women, by the way, who buy eight times as much footwear as men, <laughs> need to look cute in the footwear. It needs to make your foot look small, very important, and it needs to be just color, has to be right. Believe it or not, the entire sporting goods industry in which Reebok was operating had never figured that out. You used to walk into a sporting goods store and some guy with 40 pounds of paunch hanging over his rodeo belt, chewing tobacco, selling hooks and bullets, would point you to the uh, spot-built cleats and the Chuck Taylors in the back. Those were the athletic shoes. Oh, and maybe the upper crust stores had Adidas. Maybe. This weird German brand that Bill Cosby war. <laughs> and so that was the environment. And I remember saying, if we change the paradigm and marry it to the basic fundamental universal principle, power, law of the universe, women buying shoes, <laughs> we could probably double our business. We just need to make a shoe women want to buy. And aerobics gives us the opportunity to make a shoe that not only women want to buy because it solves a need, but women want to buy it because aerobics is an expression of feminine power through athletic activity, which, by the way, at that time didn't exist. We take it for granted today. How many of you women in this room have run marathons or triathlons or done aerobic classes or, or sweated in public? <laughs> okay. If you sweated in public, you need to understand that in 1980, it was not considered feminine to sweat in public. Not only that, but in 1980, it was not considered feminine to have muscles. Women, that was butch. Could not have muscles. Jane Fonda broke that paradigm. On her album cover, I think it was an album even, and it was also a video, remember the videotape? On the VHS, there was Jane Fonda in her outfit, sweating. There was sweat marks on Jane Fonda's outfit. Oh my God. She wasn't wearing shoes yet, by the way. So I just kind of put two and two together and said, if we can just make shoes that women want to wear for a real purpose that solves a problem, we will tap into the power of the universe called women buying shoes, and we will be in a nirvana state as a footwear company. Well, you know what? That actually happened. We actually did that. Created the aerobic shoe, and we went from 13 million in sales, which we'd done in our first two years, which was pretty good, to 65 million, to 300 million, to 700, almost 700 million, to over 900 million, to a billion three in the next five years. The fastest growing company in the history of American business until Microsoft came along. 
And in that entire time, what we had was a group of people who really the company exploded, as you can imagine. Those numbers tell you the company exploded. <clears throat> but in that explosion, you confront a, another real problem. You need people. You need bodies. And we decided we didn't just want to go hire people because they were available. We wanted to hire people who were as uh, irrational as we were. So we just started hiring people that felt right. It didn't matter if you knew how to do a certain thing. You had to have the passion for it. And that company succeeded because we didn't know what we supposedly didn't know. I, I was leading a parade. First of all, I kept saying, it's a parade. We're jumping out in front of it. That's always the best thing to do. And I remember saying to people on a whole variety of ways, this is going to change your lives. You just have to believe that this is the biggest opportunity you'll ever have. And sure enough, we built a company that was, uh, when it was sold, $3.6 billion. And that company, you know, continues this day, was sold to Adidas. And uh, the, so many people that I've, over the years, still remain very close friends with. We're all, we have this big Facebook community of Reebok alumni uh, who have, you know, they, they put their kids through college, they bought the nice home, they bought the second home on the Cape, you know, they take vacations, they have nice, you know, all that stuff. But more important, what people always talk about is how passionate they were and how much they believed in what Reebok was all about. Reebok was a company that wasn't satisfied with selling shoes. We had to go start something called the Reebok Human Rights Award because we'd gone to China and seen how people were being treated in factories and other things that we'd seen. And we, and we got involved with Amnesty International. We put on the Reebok Human Rights Now, Human Rights Now World Tour in 88. And we saw that we could make a difference, this weird athletic company making a difference. And we decided, yeah, why not? We believe that. So we became extraordinary believers in our own cause. And that <clears throat> yielded a belief in, in a group of people in what this company was doing. And we had made it all up from just sparks of insight. So to those of you here in the room who are entrepreneurs and students or hope to be entrepreneurs, that's what it's all about. It's not about your financing. It's not about your funding. It's not about uh, your patents. It's not about any of that. It's about getting people to truly believe that you understand their real needs. We understood that the real purpose for our company was to enhance the power of women through physical activity. 52% of the population that had been suppressed and had not experienced what that was all about. The other thing we said and we demonstrated, and you will have to demonstrate in your entrepreneurial endeavors, you have to demonstrate that you are committed to seeing those needs met, those real needs met that you're committed to doing that. Commitment is a funny thing. It's very transparent. Uh, you can't BS your way to commitment. There are, there's no almost committed. Just like there's no 99% uh, integrity, by the way. There's no 99% commitment. If you're going to do something, including meeting the needs of, of your employees and your consumers, then you have to demonstrate that commitment in a whole variety of ways, which may not have anything to do with your marketing plan or your PR plan. And it may have everything to do with who you are as an individual and who you hire and the kinds of conversations that you have in your organization that include people, because everyone's got an insight that matters tremendously. So that level of, of commitment that gets expressed and that people see as being real and genuine allows you then the next, the next phase, which is this idea of, of collective genius. You know, I've always been a believer that, you know, I, okay, I'm, I'm not the dumbest guy in the room, okay? But I'm not the smartest guy in the room. My goal inside my company, I've said many times, is to end up as the dumbest guy in the room. 
guy is neutral, it's not gender specific, it's the dumbest person in the room, should be me. If I've done my job, then uh, I think that's pretty good because the next group of people are going to be pretty sharp. I think that that is, at its core, uh, grounded in a certain humility about you know, who you may be as a leader and around this idea that there is a collective genius that floats around, that all of us collectively in this room solving a problem are going to do a better job than one person. Now, that sounds obvious, but you look at so many organizations and the way they're set up. They're all set up to point the decision making to one person who is supposed to have all of the right answers, either in a department or a division or in a, in a subsidiary or in a company. And it's rare that you actually get to a person at the head of that department who says, I have no idea. I don't know. What do you think? Let's, let's talk about this. Is there something you know that I don't know that helps inform what it is we're trying to solve? Now, doesn't this sound pretty obvious? You probably do it in your families, you know? It doesn't happen in corporate America. It's rare that it happens in corporate America. It's a real travesty. And in the end, I think that this lack, I, call, I refer to this as a real lack of leadership. And I think that this is what's holding America back. And uh, I'm one of those patriots who uh, is a patriot because I came here from another country. There's different kinds of patriots. You know, I'm not a patriot because I got 12 generations of people, uh, you know, making moonshine. I don't, I'm not that kind of patriot. I'm a patriot who came here from another country where things weren't so good in Cuba. Things are still not so good. And there was opportunity in America. And as a result, I'm a big believer in the collective power of America, you know, the collective genius that is America, people from all cultures, all countries, all points of view, all ethnicities, all races coming together and solving problems that human beings have always solved together. And when you take an organization, any organization, and you now tap into that collective genius that is in an organization, there's really nothing you cannot do. Our company has grown, and I've been there now 10 years. We were doing about 200 million in revenue, and last year we closed here at 1.6 billion. And we fully expect to double the size of this company in the next five years. I didn't say anything I'm not supposed to say. That's all public record. We're coming out, you know. So I didn't give you inside information. So in the end, what I, what I want to emphasize and stress is that the job of leader, the role of leader, is not something to be taken very lightly. It's not something you're going to open a book or take a course I took my leadership course, now I'm a leader. It actually doesn't work that way. Leadership is one of those amorphous things. There's an alchemy to it. It requires humility, integrity, curiosity. It requires some of the things that our very system actually works to suppress. We're supposed to come out of a, of a university education with all of the right answers. We're supposed to know exactly what to do. We're supposed to know exactly when the chips are down. We're supposed to stand up and make things happen. That's not the job of a leader, actually. The job of a leader is to understand what's true, to really bring things down to an understandable and actionable set of opportunities. And I think that that is, in effect, uh, difficult for a lot of people because you have to put yourself way back here, and the first mode you have to get into is this out in front with the compassion and the empathy part. I find myself challenged almost every day by lots of business situations that we confront, but more importantly by the personal challenges that our employees have. We have over 3,000 employees now, and you know it's a very small company because our e email makes it so, and people's dilemma, when you get to 3,000 people, people get sick. Uh, their kids have problems. There are addictions. There are train wrecks. There are plane crashes. There are all these things that happen. 
and how an organization deals with it and how people feel as part of a member of this family that we call Deckers uh, is really, frankly, what I spend most of my time focusing on. Because keeping that healthy, keeping that culture healthy is what makes everything else possible. Which I, I frankly, I, you know, I wouldn't have thought that before many years ago when all I was trying to do was sell more shoes. And the last thing on earth I think about every day is how to sell more shoes. It's not even in my conversation. So that's my perspective on being a leader. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions uh, and uh, try to do the best I can to help guide you, particularly to you students uh, who may want to know some of what is buried inside my brain. So please, thank you very much. Appreciate it. How are we on time? Did I go over or am I going to? We're good, okay. Okay. Testing. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Hebbets. I'm a first year student here at the GSM. And my question for you, Anka, is the work that Reebok did in human rights was incredibly impressive and definitely set the benchmark for other companies like Nike and Adidas that went on to also do pretty significant kind of social responsibility work. Um, is Deckers starting, or do, does Deckers also have some sort of uh, human rights or social responsibility activities? Yeah, that's. Um really in our DNA as a company. I mean, we're committed to the environment and we're committed to families. Uh, and most of our giving, uh, I'd say this last year, 60% was local to Santa Barbara County. And 40% was national charities like Waterkeeper Alliance and a, a few other things. Um, our whole approach has really been uh, to try to improve the lives of the people in our community so that we can make sure that we have a vibrant community. I think one of the responsibilities, we have, we're one of the bigger employers in Santa Barbara, which at one time there were Lockheed and, uh, you know, uh, JPL was there. There were quite a few companies. The university is the biggest employer. But private companies have uh, left. And so Deckers has be, really been in the last 10 years a source of a lot of jobs. Uh, these are not fast food jobs. These are high paying jobs. and our we feel an obligation now to make sure that we give back to the community, that, that our charitable giving is appropriate to a company as impactful as we are, and that we're also a beacon and an example for some of the other companies that come to the area. So we're always involved in river, you know, clean, creek cleanups, and our employees last year, we have a competition for the number of hours that a department, we form teams. Uh, donates back to the community. Collectively, last year, we, uh, let's say, it was 7,500 hours, and this year we're going to break 10,000 hours of employees giving to local charities. Hours, not dollars. There are dollars, but hours. So that's how we measure our involvement, people actually getting engaged. And I require everyone on my senior team to serve on the board of a local charity. You can't be on the senior team unless you do that. Because these charities need the expertise. We have some very smart people you know, in the company in various areas, so they're involved in all the, a lot of important local charities. So that's what we do. Hi, I'm Jesse Bolton. I'm a first year MBA student here as well. Uh, what you said about the, the culture in corporate America and, and leaders, especially at the highest levels that are uh, afraid to to you know ask a subordinate for for input, uh, you know that lack of meritocracy. What do you what do you think contributes to that? And, and in your experience, um, what do you what have you seen uh, from from leaders who do support that culture of a, of a meritocracy? And, and how does that help you know create and foster a, a, an environment of dignity and respect in an organization? Well, that's a good question. You know. I, I'm going to take it down a little different path than probably you're sort of thinking about. Because I, I think that this whole leadership conversation has been tied to uh, some sort of economic or power gain of some kind. 
You know, in other words, leaders mean, what does leader mean? Leader means you get the spoils. You know, leader means you're growing, you're going to have the best job or you're going to have the most power. That's what everyone sort of presumes leader means. Actually, that's not what leader is in my book, okay? Uh, leaders are, you can spot leaders in kindergarten. You can see all the little kids, you can see where the leaders are, and they're not necessarily the leaders in a competitive set. They could be the leaders in how other kids get treated. They could be the leaders in how collectively kids build the blockhouse from the wooden blocks. You know, they could be the leader of how someone is, is treated when they're crying or something like that. You know, they, they, they express a collective, they, they, they nurture a collective positive energy, if you will. And that's as important a form of leadership as the economic or power form of leadership is that we all celebrate in, in the corporate world. And I think that those are the kind of uh, uh, qualities that we all have as human beings that get suppressed over time, that we get convinced that the leaders are the ones who win. The leaders are the ones who get the best grades. The leaders are the ones who get into the best school. The leaders are the ones who have the best job and make the most money. But those aren't the leaders in kindergarten. That has nothing to do with it. So I think we've got to just step back a little bit and say to ourselves, among all of the employees, among all the people, there are people who lead for a lot of different reasons and have a lot of different insights and, and, and uh, allow the company or the group to succeed because of what they bring and the way they lead and the things they lead on. We have a woman in our company who was a victim of domestic abuse about 12 years ago. She suffered domestic abuse for about five years. When, when I came to the company, she was just getting over that, didn't quite know what to do. Uh, you know, really, it was a source of shame for her. You know, as this whole situation is horrible. And I remember sitting with her one day and saying, what do you really want to do? What, what is it that can enhance you in a way that, she said, I really want to, st I want to start working with other victims of, of domestic violence. And so we as a company decided with her lead, I said to her, then, then take us there. How do, you want us, how do you want us to do this? And she took us there. You know? and, and as a matter of fact, when this whole Ray Rice thing came down, uh, last, uh, two weeks ago, we published, uh, I think we're the very first company in the US to publish a domestic violence policy. It's, part of, it's now in our employee handbook. Here's what's gonna happen if you get accused of domestic violence, male, female, or child, or animal. Uh, this is how we're going to handle it, and it's not really good for you. So, you know, that's, so, you know, that was incredible leadership. Now, no one, she works in our accounting group. No one would say to her, she's a leader in the, con in the context of leader that we all celebrate. But in my book, she's one of the greatest leaders we have in the company. You know, so, you know, it's, I think we've got to frame the, the, the conversation around leadership a little differently so that we can include more people I'm only a leader because a lot of people want me to be, and they've helped make me the leader, you know, because I couldn't do it in any way without them, you know. But I take that very, very seriously, you know. I mean, I, that's, that's a mantle. I, 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 I cannot, you know, violate that. So it, it, it becomes, for me, an obligation that I have in order to serve those people who I work with. And, uh, you know, and I, I will do what, everything I need to do to fulfill that. So, I hope that answers your question. Okay. So you spoke at the end about your day in and day out being about supporting the culture of your organization. So as a leader, how, what actions do you take to intentionally support and build a healthy culture for you and your employees? You know, I, I tell you, one of the things that's really important is, is who not to let into your, into your club, into our company. You know, in a family, you can't pick your family members. You know, there's always that Thanksgiving where someone's going to be there, and you just wish you didn't have to be there because they're going to be there. And the question I always, is so-and-so going to be there? Oh, God. So you can't, but I can pick who we hire, 
you know. And one of the things we, we are very, we created something a few years ago which I call the Decker's Way. Now the Decker's Way is not a bunch of paragraphs. It's 12 words. Words like integrity, commitment, community, uh, fun, you know, compassion, words. And when we sit someone down for an interview, we show them the Decker's Way and we point to word number seven and we say, what does collaboration mean to you? And you'd be shocked at how many times people give me a form of this answer. I love collaboration when everyone agrees with me. <laughs> you, I get that answer. Not in those words, but I get that answer. I don't anymore. My HR people do. So obviously we don't hire that person. So we, we've got actually a, a barrier that we've created uh, that keeps people of a certain mindset out. And I hate to be as ruthless sounding as that, but that's a part of protecting your culture. And we have to protect our culture. It's working for us. Otherwise, you'll end up with something that just happened recently. I had a person who I, I had to terminate, you know, or had to uh, request his resignation because the organization was going through what I call, in the corporate sense, tissue rejection. So here's a person that seemed to fit in, seemed to do all the right stuff, was totally competent and capable, but over time, this organism wasn't having any of it and was constantly pushing him out to the fringes. And it was tissue rejection and it ended up working. And you know, and I think that's, that's a, a strength of our company that actually happens. Because at Reebok, for example, what Reebok today by all rights, should be Nike. Nike's $27 billion. We went by Nike like they were standing still. We had all the best people, all the best designers, all the best marketers, all the best talent. And then we stopped caring about our culture and we only started caring about selling more shoes and growing and filling slots. And the next thing you know, we forgot who we were. And what killed Reebok wasn't lack of ideas, lack of innovation, lack of great product, marketing, you name it, it was all from within, the classic empire collapse sort of thing, where you forget why you're there, what you're there to do, and who you want to be there with. And so when I came to this company, I vowed I was never going to allow that to happen. And so that's step one, is you got to keep the riffraff out. The other thing about that, I grew up in my apartment in the Bronx, there were a lot of cockroaches, okay? The building was built in like 1835. It was an old brownstone in the Bronx. And there were cockroaches, there were 18, 20,000 generation cockroaches. <laughs> they weren't going anywhere. You could get all the raid you wanted. They, those little suckers were not, now you can maybe keep them out of visibility. Because, but when you turn the lights off, you know, they were having a party. And there, you could have the cleanest apartment in the world. It didn't make any difference. They were just in the walls. Well, that's what happens in corporate America, too, in a big company, you know. Uh, you allow them in, and you're never getting rid of them, because they go and recruit people just like them. So Reebok recruited a bunch of people from probably the most polluted corporate environment at that time, I'm not saying it's true today, the PepsiCo company. And talk about a political, na uh, backstabbing, ruthless culture. Well, we, it was like boatloads of them came over and they all had this disease and we all got it. It was not good. And so I learned the hard way that at all costs, protect your culture if it's working for you. And you're proud of it, you know, so. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm a first year here at the GSM. Hi. You've been so successful at building companies and more importantly, finding brands that really mean something to you. How do you have a strategy or any advice for cutting through the bullshit and finding those opportunities? What do you do to make those decisions? Well, it's funny, you know, first of all, I know the business I'm in. I don't fancy myself, I'm not in the music business, I'm not in the car business, although my wife would tell you I am because I have a bunch of old cars, that one of the thing was one of mine. Um, I'm in the shoe business. And, and so over time you start to understand how, why the business works and how it works. And it's very fundamental. I'll give you a very, very fundamental insight, which has been my, I just, I kind of hit, stumbled on this when I was selling shoes in my stores, you know. I noticed that consumers came in and I was, tr I was trying to figure out why does someone walk into my store and go to that 
in front of that Nike shoe or that New Balance shoe. Uh, and I started to put together a, a sort of scenario. And the scenario I realized over time was first visual. Seems obvious, you know, you walk over. If something, if you're looking for a running shoe, you pick up, you look at something that might look like a running shoe. You don't look like something that looks like a combat boot. You look at something that might fill the need that you may have. The next is tactile. If you're expecting a running shoe to be lightweight and you pick up that thing that looks like a running shoe and it's a brick, you put it down, you don't buy it. You don't even want to try it on, you know, nothing. Okay, the, the next is intellectual. The next step is, you, so you pick it up, it's lightweight. Okay, now it looks like a running shoe. It's lightweight like a running shoe should be. I wonder if it solves my need for the marathon I've got running, uh, coming up. Let me ask this person over here. And so you, the intellectual stuff starts kicking in. I train 40 miles a week. I weigh X amount, blah, blah, blah. I run on trails versus roads. All those questions get asked and answered. Usually by then you've got a sale. And so I started to realize that all the, whatever product I was going to get involved with had to meet those three hurdles. And the ultimate hurdle is number four, which is emotional. That's when the consumer says, I love these. I love my Hoka. I love my Ugg. I love my Teva. Oh, Sanook. I love Sanook. You've now moved to the emotional connection with consumers, which, by the way, is at the core of why the shoe industry is very different, because we do have that tactile component versus e-com. You know, uh, if I want a new iPhone, I don't have to touch it. I just have to see it, read about it. So it's the emotional, not the emotional, well, it could be the emotional on iPhone, but it's the intellectual, not necessarily the tactile, it's the visual. But in the shoe industry, it's always about those three things in that order. So the brands I've been involved with, Reebok, when we first started, we were making running shoes for women in pastel colors ham-fisted early attempt at making shoes for women actually worked pretty well. And then we did the aerobic shoe. The shoe was visually arresting. It looked like a jazz dance shoe, had wrinkles in the toes, and the factory thought the wrinkles were a big mistake. I, I said, if you touch the wrinkles, I will kill you. Because <laughs> the wrinkles said soft, and soft pushed one of the buttons. Um, after uh, the Rockport company, you know, we had a shoe that looked like a and every pilot wore Rockport, right? And they looked heavy, but they weren't. You could run a marathon on them, and they looked like a running shoe, and they felt like a running shoe. After I left Reebok, we started a I started a company called Keen. Have you guys know Keen? Well, talk about visually arresting. Until Keen came along, these are the sandals with the big rubber toe bumper on the front. OK, I saw those shoes at a trade show. I was out of the shoe business. I was retired, but I was bored. And I wanted to get back in the business. I see a guy sitting there with a table of six shoes. He's sitting behind a card table. And he's come up with these weird looking shoes. And until I walked by, I didn't know I needed toe protection. Oh my god. All those years, I've been walking around in my sandals with my toes exposed to death. <laughs> and until toe protection was there, I never knew I needed toe. Until SUVs came out, I didn't know I'd need to forge a river. <laughs> in Tarzana <laughs> in July. So it's about what is visually ugh. How visually arresting is ugh, you know? I got to have that luxurious comfort. Uh, so, and, and Hoka, the world that shifted to minimalist running shoes, about this much cushioning, bad idea, especially we're old guys. I mean, great, great if you grow up uh, on a farm in Kenya. Uh, but you know, running on 130 degree pavement in LA in the middle of summer in minimalist shoes is not a good idea. And the podiatrists and orthopedic surgeons have made a killing. So anyway, uh, with Hoka, it's visually arresting. It was a represented a visual shift from what was already happening. So in my business, you make those and you get those insights, you make those connections from knowing how it all works, the process of, of how it works. And you need to know that about whatever business you're in. What are the mechanics of the process, the selling process? Because in the end, you may, you may be a leader, you may be a bunch of things, but you know what you'd really better be good at? At sales. You gotta be a salesman in any business. I don't care who you are, honestly. People delude themselves into thinking, I don't need to know anything about sales. I got salesmen for that. Wrong. 
You're selling every day. You're selling your ideas. You're selling your company. You're selling, you know, that's what you do. That's, that's the nature of commerce. Does that answer your question? Thank you.